Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Joey Galvez, one half of your host of Explain Yourself, and I want to let you guys know about a really cool book from our friend of the show, Eli Shockey. This one is called The Greylock, and it's a story where magic is a commodity. Potions are sold at corner stores. Orcs and dwarves earn a living in cubicles, not on the battlefields. But there are those who resist the house's magic laws, branded a criminal and forced to live as a want for hire. There is a spell slinger they call the Greylock. Check this one out. You guys can pre-order issue three right now with code JAN241939. And make sure you guys are heading over to your favorite LCS and letting them know that you want Greylock number three. And maybe pick up the first two issues. Uh, you could do that at the Scout web store. So make sure you guys are grabbing the Greylock number three, JAN241939 at previewsworld.com. Okay, everybody, we took this week off, but we're going to share one of our classic episodes. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, welcome to the latest episode of All Too Real 2. My name is Michael E. Cullen II, and with me, as always, is... Is Matthew Huss. Word. Mm -hmm. Word to your mother. Mm, yep. How's she doing? Anyway, so, um... The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um... Today on the show, we have an All Too interview with uh, Scott Schiaffo. Um... He is best known as the Chulies Gum Guy from the movie Clerks. <laughs> um, he's also a uh, musician and actor in um, other movies such as uh, David Madison's Wits End, and which I which is available now to stream online. Um, you can check out a lot of stuff about him on his uh, website uh, scottsyafo dot com. Um, it's a uh, he's a he's a really fun guy. It was great to talk to him. Um. Yeah, he uh, he's 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 basically he's an actor, filmmaker, and uh, and musician, which is pretty cool. Um, so he's kind of like you and I combined, Matt. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> he's also a podcaster. So, oh wow! So he's got like all three things. Uh... Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he's he, he's kind he's kind of like the, the unofficial co-host of a podcast that David Madison does, who uh, directed Wits End and Mister Hush, and among other movies. Um, David's a pretty cool guy too. Um, hope to talk to him and try to get him on the podcast in, sometime in the future. Um, anyways, um, without further ado, folks, here's uh, my little talk with uh, Scott Schiaffo. First off, uh, how you doing tonight? doing really well thanks thanks um so uh wanted to start out by just asking you like you know what uh what got you into like entertainment in general like uh i know you're a musician and an actor and everything when did you start uh getting interested in either one of those things or both well it was a very long time ago i mean i was really young um but I, my earliest memories uh, literally three four years old I had an older cousin who was like a big brother slash father figure because I was raised by a single mother. He was a big uh, music fan. And now this is the 60s and 70s when I was quite young. He would bring the newest records home. Uh, Beatles, Stones, Zeppelin, Who, Sly and the Family Stone, Otis Redding, all this kind of stuff. And I literally was like four or five years old. And I, I knew all the Beatles names before I think I knew a lot of my own family's names. Um, and I just, I fell in love with music and I was felt the same way eventually about movies and television because I was not a sports guy. 
because I was raised by a single mother and uh, I was kind of a really geeky kid. So I wasn't involved in sports really at all. I just love music and movies. Yeah, I'm the same way myself. I uh, never been a big sports guy myself because, you know, I just, you know, I don't even know any of the rules of football at all. People will be like, yeah, what, you know, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so um, I'm right there with you. I mean, I, I, I learned a little as time went on, but I had no interest in sports whatsoever and no interest in watching professional sports at all. <laughs> um, when, uh, what was the, uh, like, um, first like uh major uh i don't know like a uh, moment in your life where you decided to uh pursue music or acting or anything like that like what was the first uh first thing you did like when you were a kid or when you were older or anything like that that uh you know led you to where you are well, well musically the story goes way back and i i remember uh pretty vividly how that happened uh, acting and, and, and working on film didn't start to really become a thing uh, in my you know, uh, on my landscape until uh, like late high school, college and late teens, early 20s. Music was, like I said a moment ago, from a very, very young age. Um, my mom and I moved across town when I was quite young. I was like seven or eight. And she had gotten me a guitar and some lessons, and it didn't go well at all. <laughs> and I kind of put it in the corner, and I forgot about it. But then we moved across town, and my next-door neighbor was this really cool older kid. When I say older, he was like 18, and now I'm about 12 or so. And he played guitar, and he was pretty decent. And I pulled out my guitar, and he showed me a couple of really cool licks. And somehow this time... It really stuck. Like I, I began to play some cool riffs, and as soon as I was able to even make a little bit of music, I was super hooked on it. So I went from not being very good at it with lessons as a young kid to now 12 or 13. I have my next door neighbor showing me some rock guitar licks, and as soon as I got the hang of it, somehow it really took that second time. And I literally, from the time I was 12 or 13, Right up until my mid twenties or so, if I was awake, I probably had a guitar in my hands. I mean, I loved, I lived for guitar all those years. The acting came a little later. Came in high school, came in college. Um, I know. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you're you're best known as the Chulies Gum guy in uh, in uh, Clerks. Um, how did the uh, how did you get that role? Well, that's an interesting story, too. Uh, I mean, over the years, there's been a lot of different myths associated with the movie because of the nature of how he did it and the low budget. A lot of people think and for many years thought that everybody in the movie was either a friend or a relative. But that's just not true. Uh, most of the main cast, when I say main, I mean Dante, who's Brian O'Halloran, Marilyn Gigliotti, who played Veronica, um, and uh, myself and Lisa Spoonhour, who played Caitlin, rest her soul. We, we yeah. lost her a couple of years back. Um, we didn't know Kevin at all. We saw an ad in the paper. And I, I was an hour and a half away from everybody. I didn't live down South Jersey or by the shore where all those guys were from. I saw an ad in my local classified saying independent filmmaker chooses to examine the day in the life of a convenience store clerk. And back then, 1992, 93, no internet, no cell phones. You got your acting auditions from the trade papers and from the classifieds of your local paper. If they were looking for actors or if anybody was doing anything, then it was very rare. It, not like it is now. Basically, you know, you throw a rock, somebody's shooting a movie with their phone. <laughs> Back then, it wasn't like that at all. So I said, wow, there's a guy shooting a film in New Jersey. I got to get down there and audition. And I drove the hour and a half down there and I had my audition and I didn't think I well. But luckily, about a week later, they called back and said, we'd like you to come down now and read from the script. Because the first the first auditions we did, we did a prepared monologue. We didn't read from the clerk's script. And if he liked what you did, he gave you some scenes from the actual script and he called you back. Those are called callbacks. So very lucky for me, they liked what I did and... uh 
he we just did a podcast at his new theater. He just opened up a podcasting theater in New Jersey last uh, end of July, early basically end of July yeah. before we started shooting Clerks Three. And we had a podcast. It was myself, Kevin, and Brian, and the podcast was called Clerks Two T O O. And um, he's going to do a podcast on somewhat of a regular basis from that theater talking about everybody that was involved with that first movie and how it affected their life. So we kind of just revisited this just about five or six weeks ago. It was really fun. Got to talk to Kevin for the first time in quite a long time in a very personal way and talk about what that experience really was like all those years ago when we first came down to do the first film. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I've I've read about the uh, the theater. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with Ernie O'Donnell, and so I uh, and I, I've interviewed him on our podcast, and uh, so I, I've I've read a lot about the about that theater. I really want to get over there and uh, check that out. Next, yeah, I'm out in Ohio myself, so I gotta get over there. I've oh, been oh. yeah, been have only been to Jersey once in my life, so I've been trying to get out there again. So we'll see. But was uh, that were you able to go out to the store? Or no. Is- no, I, I any of that stuff. That's no, that. unfortunately, we didn't have time. I was, uh, I was just, I was in like northern Jersey, right by New York City or whatever. You know, um, I was in uh, New. Yeah, that's where I live. At. Yeah, I was, I was uh, right, right by, right by New York because I was going to, <laughs> going to see uh, Rent on Broadway and uh, stuff that was like, you know, I don't know, twelve, oh. 12, 13 years ago or something. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, we, we we only had a couple days that we were there, so unfortunately, I tried to talk my uh, my ex into going down there, but she was like, "No, we don't have time," and I'm like, "Oh crap!" So <laughs> she wasn't as big of a Kevin Smith fan as I am. So yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, but anyways, um, so uh, what was your uh, and so so uh, you got the you got the part. Uh, what was the experience like shooting that? Like, was it uh? Did you have fun, or was it a, a rough go of it, or was it was it fun? It was fun, but it wasn't. Um, uh, it was serious in the sense of when I first showed up on the set. Actually, before I before it was time to actually shoot, he had some rehearsals. So we went down. I went down, and we rehearsed, and because he couldn't afford to do a lot of takes the way filmmakers can now because of digital film back then you were literally shooting film and it was expensive so yeah. he didn't have a lot of shots to get it to get a take done so he we really rehearsed and his dialogue is pretty tricky and Brian O'Halloran I didn't know him then and I just met him briefly on the set uh, but he was very serious because he had so much he had to do that he had to take it seriously. And I was very happy to see that. So, yes, it was fun and creative and exciting, but it was serious at the same time. Like you were down to do a job and you gave him your best shot every take because you only got a couple of takes. Yeah. And the truth, he's got stuff from the original movie. It's cut up a little more on the Miramax version. But in the way it's written, the second scene is very long and very verbose and a lot of dialogue and um, action, too. But we only had a couple of shots of getting that. And um, after we did like the second or third take of that, I had really given it 100 percent. And like I, what will probably happen to me even here now that I'm older it happens quicker when I give full voice for more than two minutes, a half hour. I begin to lose my voice. Yeah. So I literally, and that's not shouting. There's a lot of yelling in that scene. So I was walking around out in front of the store after we were done shooting, almost like in a daze, in a really interesting, natural sort of high from all the other scene out. Can you hold on one second here? I got a... So yeah, um, with a... Uh... With that, um, I know you've uh, you've gone on to do a bunch of other independent films and everything since uh, since Clerks. Um, was Clerks your first film, or was that, uh, or, was, or had you done one before any before that? I shot a couple of things before Clerks in New York City, 
none of which ever the films were never finished and never released yeah so clerks is the actual first film that i appear in that was actually released and seen and it was a an amazing gift to all of us because it became very uh widely uh ex- you know, very very widely seen i never in a million years that the I figured it that we would have a small small cult audience and maybe we would play in some college campuses I never dreamed we would get a major release, and we did. So it was an amazing dream come true for everybody. Yeah, um, I know it's a it's a very uh, inspirational film to a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm a filmmaker myself, and uh, basically watching Clerks when I was in high school kind of inspired me to want to become a filmmaker. Um, just because I realized, you know, anybody can do it. Uh, you know, so yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I mean, it was. A great film really well written and everything and well acted um yeah and uh so what um uh, one one thing about the about the film um i've heard rumors back and forth about what the uh what the lung was that you put on the counter what what was it actually do you know <laughs> oh that's really interesting and i'll tell you why I'm I, not that i'm giving away anything so major in clerks three yeah but we revisit that in clerks three as a joke, because in the original movie, you never really got to see what that was. And it's a shame because he put a lot of work and effort into that prop in the original movie. But again, because he didn't have a lot of footage and a lot of film to waste, he never just got a shot of the lung. So you didn't get to see it. But it was a big hunk of tripe, which is cow stick. <laughs> and it's disgusting, and it looks kind of like a big sponge almost. And he, they rubbed it in dirt, and they stuck cigarette butts in it, and they wrapped it around a, a hunk of styrofoam. So when I pulled it out, it was sort of like lung shape, <laughs> but it was really gross. I mean, I had gloves with me, luckily, because had I not, it would just I didn't you didn't want to touch it. So yeah. he pulled it out and you know, put it on the table. And uh, it really made an impact. But sadly, in that first movie, you don't get to see it. But I, you know, a bit of a spoiler alert: you will see it in the new in the Clerks Three. Nice. <laughs> yeah, um, I know that you. Um, I know that you've gone on to do uh, other uh, independent films. I know some with uh, with like um, with David Madison and stuff like that. Um, I've, uh, I've I've watched part of Wit's End. I haven't finished it yet, but. Um, the what I watched of that that was pretty good so far. Um, what uh, what um, what have you been up to? Like, what other films have you done um, since Clerks? I mean, I know it, just to let people know. I mean, I know myself, but I'm just for our audience. Sure. Um, well, I've been very lucky. I've been pretty active since Clerks, and in the '90s, I had a handful of movies that were actual um, shot shot on 35 millimeter film. With people who were quite uh, profound at the time. Uh, Michael DiLorenzo, who was a New York undercover, I did a mobster comedy with him just a couple of years after Clerks. And he was, a, at that time, he was a pretty big television star. Michael's been in the business forever. He's been in a million films. Yeah. He plays Santiago in A Few Good Men, in, uh, in the movie version of A Few Good Men. Michael's been around forever. He's just really, really wonderful guy. But I got to do a film with him just a couple of years after Clerks. That was around 97, 98. But sadly, the music, the movie business is nuts. The film never was properly finished or never came out. I have a rough cut of it, and you could see a lot of it on YouTube, but the film never came out, which is heartbreaking for me wow. because at the time, uh, like I said, Michael was quite a big star, and all of my scenes were with Michael. And I figured, well, this next film will definitely be a film to help me continue to get more and more better roles. But since then, the indie film world has exploded because of technology, thankfully. And now filmmaking tools are very much um, within a lot of people's reach and cost effective. And you don't need a tremendous budget and tons of uh, high end expertise. Uh, so I've worked on everything from the smallest budget to the biggest budget in the last 25, 30 years. And like you mentioned, David Madison, I, I worked on a number of his films. Witsend came out over, I don't know, a year or two ago. But Brian Oleran and I are both in that. 
Um, I did a movie called Dark. Is way during just before COVID, before COVID hit. Uh, it's out on Amazon. It's on Tubi. It's called Darkness Waits. It's a uh, small sort of horror movie where I play a corrupt mayor. Um, and again, I guess most recently, uh, Clerks 3 was shot a few weeks ago. That's not going to be out till next year. Yeah. And I worked on Ernie O'Donnell's. Uh, uh, he's got a sitcom that they're shooting independently called On Our Own, and I had a fun uh, cameo in that recently. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, you could really, if people do care enough to check it out, a quick Google search or a quick IMDb search of me, and you'll see more than you really want to know or need to know. <laughs> I've kept very busy, at least uh, one to two films a year, just about almost every year's close whether I'm in the film or I actually maybe did the soundtrack or the score. I have been very fortunate that uh, it opened up the door for me to do music for film, whether I'm in the cast or not, because music is my uh, other real love and passion. And I'm fortunate I have that opportunity as well. So I've kept busy. That's uh that's great. Um, I mean, uh, my my co-host who doesn't do the uh, interviews usually with me because he's got a little bit of social anxiety type thing. Um, he uh, he's a, he's a musician and uh, does like scores for my movies and stuff. So it's it's always really pretty cool to um, to to know people that can do stuff like that. Um, how um, do you like really enjoy doing the the scores for movies and stuff? Uh, any uh, any uh, any ones that you're uh, really proud of? Well, you know, you mentioned Dave Madison, and I got to say, that's that's one of the more recent ones. But it's also one of the ones that uh, really sticks out because it was an interesting uh, challenge because the nature of the film is man against nature. Uh, man finds himself lost out in a snowstorm. So there's not a lot of dialogue, and there's a lot of really beautiful footage, and it, there's an opportunity for a different type of music. So I got to do everything from piano melodies to full orchestrations to guitar riffs. Uh, my partner in life, uh, Carrie Werner, Jewel Carrie, is a singer-songwriter, and she's got a couple of records out, and a couple of her tunes were featured in the movie. So Wit's End was definitely a, a real a home run for me because I know David L., and we work well together. And not only was I in the cast, along with Brian O'Halloran, but the, the scoring was a real treat because it was a challenge and also it was very creative. So another movie I did uh, a good handful of years ago now, it was available on Amazon. I don't know if it's available for streaming. It was available on DVD. It was called Linger. Writer, director named Tom Zanka, a guy I've known since high school. Uh, I also had a, the opportunity to be one of the main characters in the film. It's a short, uh, 45 minutes or so. And I also got to do the score. And it, it was a very well done production for something that was lower budget. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it didn't come off looking shabby or sounding shabby. He did a very fine job with that. So that's another one that's pretty near and dear to me as far as the music and doing film but yeah definitely have to check those out um i know i mean i like i said i've, I've watched uh probably about halfway through wit's end right now just i work third shift so i get tired a lot of times so i started getting tired and i'm like oh, i gotta turn this off because um, <laughs> i <coughs> needed to sleep <laughs> yeah the um <coughs> third shift like throughout the night i guess right yeah i, I work uh 10 p.m till 7 a.m so yeah Oh, yeah. So you're like on opposite time of most people. Yeah, like I just just woke up right before recording this at nine thirty, and so yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. Is... Like your day is night, and your night is day. Yeah, been doing it for eleven years. It's used to it, but yeah, it's uh, wow. Yeah, it doesn't it takes a long time to get used to though, because you know most people are awake and nobody else can get used to it. You got people calling you in the middle of the day you know, expecting you to do something and you're just like, yeah, I can't. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. But uh, and then when you have your days off, they're really like nights off, I guess, nights and days, right? Yeah, basically. 
Um, the uh, so um, what uh, what kind of advice would you give to anybody that's interested in getting into music or acting or um, any kind of entertainment? Well, I think that one of the most uh, I heard a piece of advice a long time ago that stuck with me because it's so harsh, but because it's harsh, I think it's there's a lot of truth to it. Um, if somebody if they sit down and they think about this, whether it's anything in creative arts, whether it's music or writing or directing or filmmaking or painting or anything where you're creating art and you need to sell your art to make a living, it's a very difficult thing. It's usually a feast or famine thing. So the piece of advice I heard was you think it through and if you feel that you can be happy doing anything else, anything else, then maybe consider that. <laughs> but if you genuinely could sit down and say to yourself, I'm not going to be happy unless I pursue a career and a life as an actor, a comedian, a writer, a musician, any of these creative arts, because it's so um, heartbreaking and so difficult to make a steady living at it. Um but if you can take that commitment and you're really passionate about it, I would tell people to go for it no matter what and to never give up because you never know when you're going to get a break uh, and you don't know what age you might be and you don't know what project could be the one that's actually going to cross over and break. I was not all that young when I shot Clerks. I was 27 when I got the role and I was 30 when the movie came out. Now, I'm almost 60, so, you know, that's not that old, 27 and 30. But when you are in your 20s and you're approaching your 30s, a lot of people, if they don't know what they're going to do with their life by then, feel like they might be lost. So I, I never gave up on the dream. And luckily, I had people in my life that were very supportive of that. And, uh, you know, if, if you dream of a – if you really want a family – uh, if that's an important thing to you, you might want to give yourself a window of time to try music and acting and filmmaking or because it is a tough thing to really make a living at. But if you really want it badly enough, I tell them that you should stick with it no matter how heartbreaking because if and when you get a break, it'll all be worth it. Yes. Uh, so, um, Back to like Clerks Three, just uh, you guys were just filming that. Um, how was it to come back and uh, see everybody that that was, they were able to see? Well, it, I mean, it was mind blowing on so many levels that uh, the the first and foremost, my memories of the original film. We were young. We were all kids. Even though, like I just told you, I was in my. In, I wasn't, uh, I was 30 when the film was actually released. That's still pretty young. We were all young. We were all very green and he, there was no money. So that's my memories of it. And they're good memories. And I know what independent and low budget filmmaking is because I've been a part of it for a long time. But Kevin was blessed with, uh, with clerks and since clerks, he's worked on all of his other films that all have, a pretty decent budget. So long story short, Clerks 3 was a fairly big budget affair as movies go. It wasn't, you know, made for a dollar fifty. It was <laughs> made with a, a good amount of money behind it. So there were trailers and there were more people doing hair and makeup for the movie than were a part of the whole last movie. There were more people <laughs> operating the camera crane then we worked on the set. You know, it was mind blowing to see that. My, I mean, I had a trailer. Wow. I had my own trailer. The Chewy's Gum guy had his own trailer. <laughs> so that tells you like just how different it was just in terms of that. But I do see a lot of those people somewhat often, yeah. except because of COVID. I don't, you know, I didn't see anybody for a while because of COVID, but I do get to see Brian at conventions. We are friends outside of the movie, Brian and I. We're not super close, but we're professional uh, peers first. And then we have developed a really nice friendship over the last 10, 15 years. I do talk to Marilyn. I don't see her that often, but I speak to her a lot. 
uh, Kevin, Kevin is the first time I saw him in person in, in a long, long time. And the first time I had a chance to really sit and talk with him was at the podcast theater opening and then on the set. Uh, but it was, oh, it was wonderful and just amazing. And for me, I only had a couple of days on the set, so it was over too fast. I, I would love to have been there every day and hanging out and yeah, and just watching and being a part of it. But it, it was wonderful. It was, uh, and I know I do believe that the original hardcore fans, I think, are going to really, really like this movie because we're, you're back to the original cast and. Now they're making, I don't know if you've talked to, you know about the premise. Are you aware of what the premise of the movie is? Yeah, I've, I've heard that they're like making, basically it's kind of like they're making clerks in a way, sort of. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks to that premise, you've got a movie within a movie, which is always a lot of fun yeah. on a lot of levels. But for that movie, especially since it is a big cult classic now, I think the original fans are going to really love it and not see it as some kind of cheesy sequel, which it's not. You, you're really wrapping up these people's lives and, you know, getting to see where they're at now as middle-aged men and women. It's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, it's like, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, I know that uh, I, haven't, I haven't been to a movie theater since before COVID, which really kind of just, it, it's, it's, miserable you know you can't you know i i used to go to the yeah, movie, mo movies at least once a, once a month or so and uh now i uh haven't been so long and um i know for a fact that i really can't wait to just see this like on a big screen i really want right. to right when, when it comes you wanna, out, here's yeah. something crazy yeah, yeah. this is uh, thanks to covid the last movie i saw in a theater was the jay and silent bob reboot Wow. That's how long I haven't been out to the movies because then COVID happened. And then, you know, I mean, I love movies. I don't, I don't go to the theater nearly as much as I'd like to before COVID. Yeah. So then you get, you add COVID to that. Literally Jay and Silent Bob reboot was the last movie I saw in the theater with a big crowd and, you know, having a ball and that kind of thing. So I can't wait to see the new clerks. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I just I can't wait to see anything in a really theater. Get yeah, I, I miss movies. Yeah, I, it's, it's I miss a wonderful. I miss movies. I miss live performances. I miss anything you know in a communal oh, yeah. setting. You know when you can actually sure. be with a crowd. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the um, so uh, what um, what do you have coming up? Anything else coming up besides uh, Clerks Three? Well, as far as that's, I've already been shot and will be coming out. Uh, it's Clerks 3, which will be coming out next year, but early next year. Uh, and I don't know when Ernie and the folks who are working on um, on our own, the sitcom, I don't know when that's going to get any kind of public release, but that'll probably be early next year. Uh, a lot of things I worked on over covid have come out uh, a lot of things during covid were released during covid and like i said if you see my imdb or you see me on any of the social media you'll catch snippets and you'll catch where you can get these films streaming or on dvd darkness waits that came out last year uh which end last year and my mind is foggy because of covid i'm forgetting <laughs> what was you know a few months and a few years but these are all, I'm very fortunate to have kept working through it. I did a very crazy drama called, um, oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting the name of it. And the filmmaker is going to slaughter me if he hears this. <laughs> um, oh my God. Well, <laughs> well, I know it's Tom Zanka wrote and directed it. I did the score. I'm only in one episode, uh, but it was a conspiracy theory uh, series about um, <clears throat> more or less what's happening politically and all, and 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 you know, Big Brother's always watching the deep state. 
Oh, okay, the Deep State. All right, awesome. The Deep State, and it's released on YouTube, written and directed by Tom Zanka. Same individual that I did the movie Linger with. Awesome. Who, uh, he's a very fine writer, uh, director, who uh, I've known, I know him personally as well as we've worked professionally. Um, so, yeah, the Deep State. I did a thing called uh, Jesus versus Satan, The Rise of the Zombies. That came out in 2020. That's on YouTube. Nice. Uh, that's a very exciting thing. It's funny, really funny. Chris <laughs> Pierre Domenico, uh, he shot most of that during COVID. Oh, wow. And he, he, and he edited it, and it came out really well. And I'm very fortunate. I get to keep working, uh, COVID or not, and I have my podcast which is not really mine, David Madison's end of the night on Sunday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern. Yeah. We interview film people and music people, and we have a fun sort of pop culture podcast that I am the official, unofficial co-host of. Nice. Yeah. I've, I've listened to an episode or two of that because I'm, I'm friends with David oh, on Facebook too. So yeah, that's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the, uh, um, how was it actually speaking of COVID? How was it filming during COVID? Um, like, well, what we did, uh, we all were able to film our own parts with our own cameras, yeah, and yeah. send the director the footage. So I had my camera set up, <clears throat> you know, I had the shot set up, and on the phone in real time is the director in a Facebook FaceTime. So he sees what's happening. Oh, wow. He's in the room, but not physically in the room. Yeah. And he did that with just about everybody. So a lot of the people got to film their parts on their own. And it was mind blowing. And it all worked together really well because a lot of the movie is people talking to one another on their phones. So you, you can get away with that. Yeah. So it's on YouTube Jesus Burton Satan. Jesus versus Satan in Rise of the Zombies. Brian Dunkelman is in it, the guy from. Uh, uh, oh God! I keep I'm forgetting everything here. He was uh, a co-host, and I think of America's Got Talent. It, it was like he was the he was one of the original American Idol uh, hosts. American Idol, right? Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm he's fa- got a big part. He's very funny. Yeah, he's he, he seems like a good guy too. Um, Ming Chen is in it from Comic Book Men. Ming Chen is in it as well. Awesome. Uh, fun, fun stuff. Very fun stuff. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to definitely check that out. Um, it sounds it yeah, sounds fun. Yeah, um, free and on YouTube. You know, you can't beat that. No, free is always good. <laughs> yeah. Um, ah. <laughs> any uh, anything else you you wanted to um say before we uh, let you go here tonight? Uh no. Well, you know, we've covered uh, a lot of ground, Michael. Thank you for having me. I, I'm very happy you reached out and we got to talk. Yeah, um, me too. If you look me up anywhere on the internet, whether it's social media or Google. You're going to get way more than you really care to know anyway. So please follow me if you have the inclination to. Um, my career is such that I'm able to be hands-on with a lot of things. Uh, I run my own social media and my own website. Uh, ScottShiapo.com, there's a link where you could buy personalized merchandise. And most of the money goes to an animal shelter nearby that I work with. So I like to plug that. Yeah. Uh, ScottShiapo.com, on that page, you'll see a link, buy merch, and you'll see the Angels of Animal Rescue. Uh, I, I partner up with them, and they sometimes get as much as 70% of the sales from that site goes right to the animals. So it's pretty awesome. That's that's great. Um, you know, I, I saw that on your site when I was looking it up the other day, and I, I, I think that's very cool that you're uh, helping out animals because, you know, Everybody loves animals, and uh, if they don't, there's something wrong with them. Um. Yeah, and you know, and you know, they, animals can't speak for themselves, you know. Yeah, and I uh, mean, children can't either. I mean, I, I care deeply about humans too. Definitely. But my my lady friend, who I love dearly, over the last two and a half decades of knowing her, she's really opened me up to nature and animals. And uh, Jewel Carey, aka Carrie Werner. Who I love with all my heart. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I uh, I thank you for your time tonight. And uh, yeah, if you, if you ever have anything you want to promote and you want to come on, just let me know, and uh, we'll have you back on anytime. Um, it was uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you, and I hope you have a good night. 
You do. Thank you, Michael. You have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Okay, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview there with uh, with Scott Scaffo. Um, the uh, really cool thing about him is um, I, I recommend going to his website, um, buying some of his merch because all the money um, goes to uh, help out animals, um, which is really cool. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, you know you can buy some of his merch and uh, it'll help out a local animal shelter in New Jersey where he lives. And uh, you know, like he said, animals don't have a voice, so you know, right? We gotta help them, people. You know, um. Yeah, uh, I don't know. That, that it was interesting to listen to him talk about uh, stuff from Clerks and other things. Um, anything on your mind, Matt? Um, before we uh, wrap things up here today? No, just kind of just going off what you said. You know, it's it's good to support you know artists and you know, uh, especially if they're you know going to be giving the proceeds to you know a good cause like you know animal rights you know groups or shelters. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, you know, to be a voice for the voiceless is always cool, you know, so, yeah, that's basically what I, I always think is good, you know, and um, speaking of animals and stuff, um, so uh, at Walmart, they keep playing this, uh, this uh, recording, which I think is sad that they have to play, it, <laughs> it goes, um, it goes, uh, you know, you, you, you've entered the store or club and uh, you feel like you've forgotten something. Was it your purse? Was it your phone? Maybe it was your child or your dog. <laughs> wow. The, the fact that they have to have an ad like that. Um, wow. You know, you should make sure when you go into a store <laughs> that you don't leave your dog or kid in the car. <laughs> Or, you know, this could be another thing, too, if some people's lives are just so stressed out and stuff and they're, like, burning candles at both ends that they're just, like, they literally just, like, oh, I think I forgot my kid here. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, shit, Johnny's in the back seat. Um, and- but then again, it's kind of interesting because companies like Walmart that actually perpetuate those kind of things that goes on. So it's kind of interesting that they're the ones saying, oh, you forgot your kid because people like me are stressing you out so much that you can't think. Well, now I'm reminding you because I'm the one that's causing it to happen. Yes. But, you know, interesting. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's all good. It's just a, yeah. it's just like another ad that I saw where uh, that I heard on in, in, in a Walmart, which, um, you know. It's okay, uh, whatever. I don't care if Walmart retires to retaliate against me for being pissed off at them. Um, anyway, so the uh, the um, the, there was a, a thing that was saying, you know, you having trouble getting uh, getting your kids to to uh, pay attention to their homework. You know, it's like, you know, why don't you buy them some toys or something to reward them for uh, what? Yeah, that's that was literally something I heard in a Walmart. Oh my god! Yeah, and um, my, my thing with it is, is um, you know, and right when I heard it, I just yelled at the thing and I said, "Yes, let's uh, let's bribe your kids with commerce." <clears throat> yeah, that's. I mean, they, they definitely should have a, a reward tier system for things, but like not so much as like I'm going to buy you a toy every time you do your homework. Yes, <laughs> like, you know, it's ba- like, it's it's basically just Walmart saying, "Hey, you know." Johnny did his homework. Let's let's buy him a Batman action figure or something. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. Exactly. You know, it's from, like, from our store. From yes, our store. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that we get the money for it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Oh God, I love the world, Matt. But anyways, yeah, um, <laughs> but anyways, make sure you check out the uh, links in our show notes for uh, stuff about Scott Scott um, and his uh, and his work and. Um, you know, going to his website is the best best way to find out all the stuff about him. You know, his his Twitter, his Instagram, his Amazon, um, his music, and his booking and everything too on there. Um, yeah, no, just check him out. He was a good guy. It was nice of him to talk to us. Um, and uh, you know, look forward to seeing him uh, next year in Clerks Three, which will be awesome. I can't yes. wait, can't yes. wait to see that on the big screen. Um, I don't care even if you know have to wear a mask to go see it i'm gonna go see it mm-hmm. um 
but yeah um also make sure you uh you know check us out everywhere you can um all too real com has got all of our links and everything um you know you can check out our uh our t public i just got my shirt from t public and um okay. i'm gonna try to post pictures of it or something somewhere but man it is really good quality nice soft material i like the you know it's it's the the printing on it is just beautiful so you know you can get yourself an all too real to uh t-shirt you can get some other t-shirts that we have on there um good quality stuff there at uh t public um also um you know you know doing that helps our show you know you know even though we only get a couple bucks from each sale it still will help us you know might buy us dinner some night or something you know <laughs> um but it'll 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 help keep the lights on as they say um and uh you know share the show with your friends you know if you like us um and if if there's uh anybody you want to hear us interview um and you know them you know send them our way i'd love to talk to anybody in the entertainment industry um it's it's always fun to do these interview episodes um but you know um also folks you know you know be careful out there um you know wear a mask wear a condom <laughs> um and until next time folks bye bye thanks for listening to all too real 2 podcast a cullen park production Produced and edited by Michael E. Cullen II. Music by Matthew Haas. Subscribe and share the show. Visit us at cullenpark.com.